This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. What is going on Solo fam? My name is John Solo and it's officially the most romantic month of the year. February is upon us. Valentine's Day is right around the corner and my bank account is already prepping itself for the beating it's about to take. Full disclosure, just laying my cards out on the table here, I've never been the biggest fan of Valentine's Day. I wouldn't go so far as to say it's a pointless holiday, but it's undeniable that it puts a whole lot of unnecessary stress on relationships and single people who desperately wanna be in relationships. And that's a shame, in an ideal world, Valentine's Day would pass by as swiftly and silently as Kashmir Pulaski Day, only being celebrated by the people who it's most relevant to and almost completely ignored by everybody else. But that's not the world we live in, son. There is money to be made. So every time you want groceries from January 1st to February 14th, Cupid's gonna shoot you right in the face. And I don't mean with his bow and arrows. What's that? You're alone this year? Sucks to be you. Enjoy this side of candy hearts with your entree of loneliness. Did you enjoy your depressing appetizer? Could I interest you? and an involuntarily celibate amuse-bouche? I've lost sight of where I was going with this joke. Look, my point is, whether it's love or hatred, people all over the world have strong feelings about Valentine's Day. But does anybody know why we started celebrating it in the first place? A quick Google search would tell you it has its roots in both Roman and Christian history, and that's come to be accepted by scholars and laymen alike. But when you actually hear the evidence, those theories become a lot less convincing, and the mystery gets deeper. So we're gonna be diving into it head first. For those who enjoy messed up content that's both entertaining and teaches you something, be sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons to have new episodes delivered right to your sub box and recommended feed every Thursday. And now, the messed up origin of Valentine's Day. So what Roman tradition is Valentine's Day supposedly inspired by? A certain festival held every year called Lupercalia, also known as Dies Februatis, which means the purification. It's also where we get the name of February. Lupercalia was a day to honor Lupercus, the god of fertility. And I can already see the connections forming in your brain. You think that because Lupercalia honored a fertility god that its evolution to a romantic holiday where tons of babies are made seems pretty reasonable. But stay with me, because originally the fertility that Lupercal presided over only applied to livestock. Yeah, this was a festival for shepherds, not lovers. It took place every year on February 14th in the Lupercal, a cave where Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome, were nurtured by the she-wolf and watched over by the god Lupercus. People would gather there to sacrifice goats and young dogs to Lupercus, animals that were known for their fertility, and in exchange, their livestock would be blessed with a fertile season. After the sacrifices were all made, two young men would be led to the vat of animal blood where they touched their foreheads with a sword that was dipped in the blood, after which the men were supposed to burst out laughing, though we're not sure why. Another common festival tradition outside of copious amounts of binging on food and alcohol was half-naked men draping themselves in the skin of these sacrificed animals to mirror the god Lupercus's appearance, and using strips of animal skin to whack passers-by. Not something I would want to be on the receiving end of, but apparently, as time went on, it became tradition for women hoping to have children to volunteer to be whacked, as they believed it would make childbearing easier. Just imagine if that belief was still commonly held to this day. Your first day of Lamaze class would feel like a hazing ritual. As you can see, though, Lupercal doesn't have a whole lot in common with the modern conception of Valentine's Day, and if it did, I don't think it'd be considered a romantic holiday. By the way, did you notice it didn't even incorporate Cupid, the Roman god of love, or doves, which have somehow gone on to become Valentine's icons in modern times? Interesting, right? So tell me, how did we get from this to this? Well, some scholars say Christian influence, but while I'm no history expert, when it comes to physical evidence that supports their theory, there's about as much of that as there is evidence that I'm secretly Jojo Siwa. Genuinely very excited about glasses. I'm actually so scared. Like I was saying, I'm so happy right now. <laughs> What do you mean you don't see it? One phenomenon that we've been discussing maybe a little too much lately is the Christianization of pagan holidays. For those who don't know, as Christianity began its domination of the planet, the official church would often absorb and repurpose any pagan traditions that it couldn't get its recently converted formerly pagan worshipers to give up. By doing this, they made it easier for the heathens to ease into the new faith. To a lot of them, it didn't really matter if they were praising Saturn, celebrating the winter solstice, or honoring the birth of some dude with wine flowing through his veins. As long 
as they could spend the occasion making merry with friends and maxing out on good food, they were content. That's exactly how we ended up with Christmas being celebrated in December, despite Jesus most likely being born in the spring. The reason I'm explaining all this is because, big surprise, the leading theory about the creation of Valentine's Day basically follows the same track. The problem this time around is there's almost no evidence to support it. Don't get me wrong, the Christians do have a proven track record with this sort of thing, but you have to consider that with Christmas, we have physical Viking sagas written centuries ago that contain details about how Viking kings like Hakon carefully integrated pagan celebrations such as Yule into his new Christian belief system. Not only that, but after that transition occurred, Christmas resembled Yuletide more than it did its original form. There was now feasting, drinking, socializing, and gift giving, instead of the much less enjoyable Christian activities of fasting and praying. But when it comes to Lupercalia, St. Valentine's Day didn't take on any of those practices, which really shouldn't shock you after hearing what the festivities entailed. So, if the ritual parts of the holidays have nothing to do with each other, why do people think they're connected? Well, to start, there's the fact that early Christianity did do the exact thing it's being accused of here, appropriating cultural customs for its own gain, multiple times to multiple kinds of people. And while we haven't been able to pin down the specific year the final Lupercalia celebration took place, we know the party ended around the fifth century of the current era. Roughly around the same time that Pope Galatius I announced that St. Valentine's Day would be on February 14th, the day before Lupercalia. To make it even more suspect, Galatius was very well known for his hatred of Lupercalia and pagans. He may have even hated them more than Anakin hated sand. I don't like sand. People. Sand people. I hate them. That is pretty much all the evidence this theory has though. There are no letters, journal entries, hidden scrolls, nothing to indicate that Galatius' placement of St. Valentine's Day so close to Lupercalia was a strategic move meant to phase out the pagan holiday. Now it's totally possible that written evidence did exist at one point and has just been lost to the sands of time. After all, it's been about 1600 years. But that, combined with the holidays having nothing to do with each other ritualistically, is reason enough for me to not bet all my chips on this one. So if Valentine's Day wasn't created to replace Lupercalia, that means it really was to honor St. Valentine. Who the hell is that? Well, you're gonna hate this, but we really don't know for sure. Because as I mentioned, record keeping back then was not the greatest, and there were a ton of Christian martyrs named Valentinus whose stories were likely exaggerated. The earliest one that we found was killed in Africa along with 24 soldiers. We don't know virtually anything about him or how he died, but if I were to guess, he was probably there to convert people who didn't want to be converted. Another candidate is a Roman priest named Valentinus whose story was printed in the Acta. Granted, the act has been criticized by scholars about its historical value, but it tells us that Valentinus was arrested during the reign of Emperor Gothicus and put into the custody of an aristocrat named Asterius. Supposedly Asterius made a big mistake in letting Valentinus talk and was ultimately coerced to give Christianity a shot, but only if the priest could cure his daughter's blindness. Well, guess what? That's exactly what he did. He put his hand over the blind girl's eyes, said some words about Jesus, and boom, she was cured. So Asterius' family agreed to be baptized. It didn't take long for Emperor Gothicus to find out about this betrayal though, and when he did, he had the whole family executed, with Valentinus specifically getting beheaded. So Pope Glacius created the holiday on the suspected day of his death, February 14th, in honor of his sacrifice. The third and final candidate for the true namesake of Valentine's Day was another priest named Valentinus whose story is almost identical to the previous one. Only instead of healing his captor's daughter, it was his son. And instead of taking place in Rome, it happened in Terni, a city in Central. Italy. Chances are though this Valentinus was actually the same as the last one and each city just had their own version of his story. But like I said, we don't even know for sure if any of these Valentinus characters actually existed in real life. Pope Galatius obviously had someone in mind when he established the holiday, but due to the church's poor record keeping back in the 5th century, we'll never know for sure who the man being honored was or what he did to deserve it. What we can say for certain though is that whichever Valentinus it was, his holiday being a romantic one has nothing to do with him. You may have heard that our hero was honored for risking his life to conduct Christian marriage rituals or that Valentine's Day cards originated from him passing notes between Christian lovers jailed by Emperor Gothicus, but those are completely unsubstantiated claims that have no basis in history. Like a lot of the folklore theories we deal with on this channel, these claims just happened to find their way online and were circulated by journalists who were desperate for something topical to write about and didn't have the time to pursue every single lead to its origin point. 
No, believe it or not, but the romance element to Valentine's Day didn't come from the man himself, but instead is believed to have been introduced a full 1,000 years after the holiday was established. If you're looking to blame somebody for you spending every Valentine's Day alone and miserable while your friends, classmates, and coworkers are treated to dinner dates, flowers, and cans of crush, look no further than Geoffrey Chaucer. Because before his poem, Parliament of Fowls, was published in 1382, there's no indication that the holiday had anything to do with romance. But this guy just had to go and notice that birds tend to do their mating around February 14th every year. For this was on St. Valentine's Day, when every fowl comes there, his mate to take. Of every species that men know, I say, and then so huge a crowd did they make, that earth and sea and tree and every lake was so full that there was scarcely space for me to stand, so full was all the place. After this poem began circulating, nature-minded European nobility started sending love notes during bird mating season. Still though, the traditions that we've grown accustomed to, like gift exchanging, romantic dinners, and kinky bedroom activities, like strip duel monsters, weren't widespread among the common folk. I think that layman people back then were more focused on making sure their family had food and shelter, while the idea of dedicating an entire day to romance was a luxury that most couldn't afford. The next published reference to Valentine's Day occurs a few centuries later in Shakespeare's Hamlet, published in the 1600s. In scene five of act four, Hamlet's potential wife Ophelia sings a song. Tomorrow is St. Valentine's Day, all in the morning, bedtime and I am made at your window to be your valentine. Then up he rose and donned his clothes and duped the chamber door, let in the maid that out a maid never departed more. Rough translation, when the girl showed up at the guy's window, he invited her inside and they did what lovers do, played strip duel monsters. According to Jacqueline Simpson from the Folklore Society, this song stems from a commonly held belief back then that the first woman a man sees on the morning of Valentine's Day is his true love. This belief is then substantiated in the diary of Samuel Pepys, a high-ranking official in England's Navy who lived throughout the 17th century. He discusses practices like feasting, flirting with your valentine, giving gifts of embroidered gloves or silk stockings to your lady. And he even mentions that on Valentine's morning, his wife walked around the house with her hands over her eyes to avoid seeing the workmen who were there and risk one of them becoming her true love. People were so dumb back then, weren't they? And I mean that in the most endearing way possible. So I think it's safe to say that Valentine's Day had started to ease into mainstream culture by the 1600s, as is evidenced by Shakespeare and Samuel Pepys. And it didn't take long for opportunists to start using this holiday to make money. And the Industrial Revolution played a key role in that. Because up until the mid 1800s, it was still common for Valentine letters to be handmade. But thanks to technology allowing them to be mass produced, pre-made cards were much easier for the everyman to get a hold of and decorated much more elaborately than was possible by hand. That accessibility did cause some trouble though. People would often use the occasion to send anonymous Valentine cards containing nasty insults and offensive imagery to their enemies. In fact, by the 1890s, the tradition of giving Valentine cards had almost completely died out over in England and it's theorized that this behavior is the reason. Over in America though, cards were still as popular as ever. They originally made their way over here in 1847, the holiday itself was being celebrated nationwide before the 1950s, and by 1913, only two decades after they had died out across the pond, the world-famous Hallmark began mass-producing Valentines in Kansas City, Missouri. Now, the commercial component did take a dip in popularity during World War II, but the story goes that after the war was over, mass production of Valentine's Day goodies was put into overdrive. Sending cards was once again popular over in the UK, and from there on, the tradition continued to grow, evolve, and make its way into other cultures who've created traditions of their own. That'd be pretty fascinating to talk about too, but I think I've kept you here long enough. Now I want to know, what are your thoughts on the origins of Valentine's Day? How does it feel to learn that it has nothing to do with Lupercalia and that we really don't know who St. Valentine even was? Let me know in a comment down below where I'll be engaging in the conversation as well. And while you're doing that, let me tell you about the sponsor who made this episode possible, Squarespace. Hey you, with the face, are you an artist, small business owner, or a creator? Do you need a way to show off, market, and sell your talents that doesn't limit you to the creative confines of social media? Well, building your own website is a great place to start, and there's no one that makes that process easier than Squarespace. Let me show you how it's done. 
First, you answer a short survey where you describe what your site is about. You set a goal, choose what stage best describes where you are in the process, and in the end, you're given dozens of templates to choose from that are best suited for your needs. That's exactly what I did for my website, MessedUpOrigins.com, and I'm pretty happy with how it turned out, from the list of resources I use in my research to the Solo Fam Art Gallery. In addition to being easy to use, Squarespace also ensures that you're getting the most out of your bill by offering award-winning customer service 24 hours a day and giving you access to a ton of marketing tools and analytics so you can see how well your site is performing. What may be my favorite feature though is that Squarespace never requires you to download, patch, or install anything to use it. You can build an entire website in the same browser you're watching this video in. So go to squarespace.com slash John Solo to try out the service completely free. And when you're ready to reveal your masterpiece to the world, use code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase. Wasn't that fun? Aren't you glad you didn't skip it? Back to business though. Also make sure you hit those like and subscribe buttons to fill that empty void where my self-esteem used to be and to get more content like this delivered to your sub box every Thursday. To stay updated on messed up origins news, like what's going on behind the scenes and what content to expect next, either follow me on social media or pay a dollar to join our Patreon and Discord. Then follow this little guy on Instagram, especially if you're alone on Valentine's Day this year. He and his sister's goofy faces will help you dry those tears. How you doing, buddy? You're not falling asleep, are you? I'll see you all again next week with a new episode of Mythology Explained about the gods of wealth and poverty. Until then, thank you all so much for watching, and remember, John shot first. Thank you.